so should we start yes are we ready so uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, thank you for coming uh, after the lunch to uh, on time to this uh, very important panel uh, why the very important panel because uh, this year i would say five uh, years have passed since the establishment of uh, the eastern partnership within the EU framework that uh, was the, during the uh, Czech uh, presidency. Um, in fact, uh, reacting to uh, the Polish, uh, Sweden, Swedish proposal. Uh, a little bit more time has passed since uh, the launching of uh, another uh, project uh, on the southern flank, not on the eastern flank of uh, of Europe, that's uh, uh, the Union for Mediterranean uh, under the French uh, presidency. That was a proposal by President Sarkozy, if I remember this well. And there was a common denominator, I think, uh, 2008, 2009, that was uh, the, the, the time when Europe was uh, seriously hit by uh, the Western economic crisis. Uh, it was also the year uh, or two years of this extraordinary battle for the Lisbon Treaty. And it was also the era when uh, the European Union was uh, trying to absorb uh, uh, the impact of uh, the last huge uh, wave of, uh, wave of uh, the EU enlargement. And it was pretty clear that uh, uh, there is not an overall will uh, among uh, the EU member states uh, to continue rapidly uh, with the enlargement. At the same time, everybody was aware of the fact that we should not leave uh, neither the southern nor the eastern uh, neighborhood alone. Uh, so those two projects were a product of uh, an intention to extend the helping hand. And I think that uh, uh, the foreign 2000 authors could not uh, uh, select uh, the better introductory speakers for this panel than Jacques Rupnik and Gilles Kepel. Uh, both are the French, so it was under the strong French uh, influence or leadership. Uh, Jacques is uh, a man who devoted, I would say, entirely his life uh, studying, analyzing, and advising uh, regarding the development in Eastern Europe, writing a lot of books. Gilles Kepel is the leading French intellectual on uh, Mediterranean, Islam, Arab uh, uh, affairs, as well as uh, the greater uh, Middle East. They have undergone, uh, as I am aware, of some uh, fruitful uh, dialogue uh, reflecting the establishment of uh, the European neighborhood policy, uh, both in the eastern and uh, southern flank. So I think, Jacques, tell us something, you know. What was uh, your perception five years ago, and what is your analysis today regarding this project. Well, first of all, thank, thank you for, for um, introducing uh, uh, so kindly uh, me and Gilles as both French, but with, with a Czech connection of different kinds, because uh, I'm, of course, a Prague-born Frenchman, and he, his father is a Prague-born Frenchman. So uh, uh, that brings us to this town, and that's why uh, we like to exchange. Uh, my field is mainly Eastern Central Europe and the Balkans, and he always now steals the show because the attention is uh, uh, constantly shifting to the south. And in fact, this idea of East and South is really was the initial dilemma of the neighborhood policy. The main criticism formulated to EU's neighborhood policy is that it is undifferentiated. And the Eastern Partnership was born out of this idea that you cannot treat in the same way Ukraine and Jordania, that the 
problems, the environment are not the same, and the question of democratization is not the same either. And finally, that you should distinguish between European neighbors and neighbors of Europe. European neighbors meaning those who perhaps have a prospect of one day uh, becoming part of the European, uh, of the European uh, project. So uh, that's, that's where we start, the differentiation. What challenged those, uh, and, and it seemed that the Prague uh, uh, Eastern Partnership, you know, set EU onwards and upwards on its course of uh, developing that policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Eastern Partnership. Uh, the um, uh, Arab Spring and the recent revolution in Ukraine have challenged those concepts that were prevailing when the policies were established. And uh, both have confronted the EU with the question of democratization and its role in democratizing processes on its peripheries and with the limits of its role and when democratizing promises can turn into security threats. And uh, that shift, not only in the situation in the neighborhoods, but in the perception of what is at stake, uh, is of course crucially important in assessing that uh, policy. And Arab Spring and Euromaidan in different contexts obviously provide us with uh, illustration uh, uh, important for the reconsideration of the neighborhood policy. Um, why, it, particularly in Central Europe, it is interesting to reflect upon that, because the neighborhood policy, <coughs> in a way, was, uh, uh, has inherited a lot of the legacies, the positive legacies, the success story of the Central European enlargement of the EU. Basically, um, uh, what was that, what was a contribution of the EU to the democratization uh, in East Central Europe, consolidation of democracy, rule of law, these were the crucial elements that played a part in the integration into the European Union. And of course, that is important if you want to speak about at least the Eastern Partnership. Issue of corruption is a crucially important issue. The question of rule of law and the idea that the European prospect have is a tool, is a way of developing the ideas, the institutions of the rule of law on its periphery. That was one attraction. Uh, 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 one attractive legacy seen, let's say, from Kiev or from the eastern periphery. The second uh, positive legacy was the formidable convergence of East Central Europe with Western Europe. If you look at it from the Balkans, if you look at it from uh, 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 the uh, Western periphery of the former Soviet Union, what do you see? You see that uh, a country like Poland 15 years ago, I'm giving very roughly, its GDP per capita compared to European average, it was one third. In 10, 15 years, it is two thirds. It's a spectacular uh, improvement. Take Slovakia, take most of them. Uh, 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 you can see that. <laughs> if uh, uh, you compare the GDP per capita of country like uh, uh, Ukraine and Poland, 1989, they are roughly the same in GDP per capita. Today, Poland, GDP is three times GDP per capita. So I'm not saying that the motivations of the demonstrators on Euromaidan were economic, but clearly both the idea of uh, uh, the rule of law, tackling the corruption, which is the main issue which they were after, and modernization and prosperity were connected with the European prospect. Now, that is why the Central European experience became attractive eastwards. What does the EU propose? It proposes to use the same toolbox, a lot of the same toolbox, but not the prospect of European inclusion. So, <laughs> Neighborhood policy is conceived as an alternative to enlargement, and it uses a very similar toolbox. What is on offer? Essentially, if you look at the association agreement proposed to Eastern Partnership members, um, <coughs> you have first opening of the market uh, of the EU in 
exchange of adoption of EU norms, including, therefore, rule of law practices, better governance. Okay. Secondly, mobility, visa facilitation, uh, that is the second element. And thirdly, financial assistance uh, for, uh, for economic reforms. That sounds good on paper, but it's a fairly minimalist program. And EU didn't think one moment that with such program, like opening market versus adoption of norms, that that would be enough to first transform a reform process in Ukraine into a revolution, and secondly, uh, bring about a, a Russian response, uh, uh, which includes using of force and annexation of territory. So there you have the EU, and I must cut a long story short, the normative power, the soft power, whatever you want to use, confronted with the realities of geopolitics, with the reassertion of sheer geopolitics, and that behind democratization, the sort of uh, uh, normative power of the EU, that what is at stake is the relationship with Russia. And there, essentially, you have three issues which will shape in the future, which define even today, the neighborhood policy of the EU. You have the question of democracy, rule of law, and uh, the kind of things we are that have been raised openly through the Euromaidan revolution. You have the question of security, which I don't have to spell out when you have <laughs> annexation of territory, such as in Crimea or the destabilization of eastern Ukraine. And thirdly, you have the energy question, you know, uh, uh, and the dependence of uh, a number of European countries on Russian energy supply. And the, nobody would dispute the importance of the three issues. The question is, what is the hierarchy of priorities between these issues? How do you connect security, democracy, uh, and, uh, and energy? Uh, incidentally, you may have, this may be a parallel with the southern neighborhood. You find those three issues <laughs> in the EU's dilemma in the southern neighborhood uh, as well. And of course, within the EU itself, there is a debate about what is the hierarchy of priority. Should security be the number one priority for most people? Or should it be the safety of our energy supply? Or should it be you know, encouraging democratic change where it's happening, such as in Ukraine? And uh, uh, th those dilemmas, of course, create uh, uh, dividing lines within the EU uh, itself. Now, uh, 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 we will discuss, and I don't have the time to do that, uh, the interaction, the interplay between the eastern and the southern neighborhood, but clearly, you know, the picture looks different from, uh, let's say, Warsaw or from Tallinn uh, than if you look at it from, uh, from Lampedusa uh, uh, or from Paris, for that matter. So uh, there you are. Uh, we are confronted with a policy that was established for fair weather, so to speak, and that has been blown apart by uh, uh, circumstances both east and south that I don't have to dwell on. And the question is, uh, how do you reinvent a new neighborhood policy for the EU that would entail, that would take on board this geopolitical dimension, bearing in mind that the EU was conceived on the repudiation of geopolitics? The whole concept, the whole idea of European integration after World War II was based on the idea that we refuse <laughs> the logic of power politics and <clears throat> geopolitics in particular, because that destroyed Europe in two world wars uh, in the 20th century. So there it is. You have to rethink the neighborhood policy with the geopolitical components. And secondly, how do you project the EU influence on its periphery? How do you engage in the democratizing in its periphery if the very center of the EU is in doubt? And I don't have to spell that one out. You look at the results of the elections, European elections on May 25th, to see the kind of doubts Europeans have about the project. Maybe I will not uh, release you so uh, easily. And with uh, your permission, I was we'll not escaping. ask uh, Evan a small question. Uh, you portrayed that uh, 
this is a certain clash between uh, the soft power of the EU on one hand and uh, the reality of geopolitics on the other hand. Some politicians have structured this in, in those uh, cries about, you know, uh, uh, 21st century meeting the policy of the 19th century. That was the German Chancellor and others used that uh, uh, this spring. Uh, a certain turning point was uh, the EU meeting with the Ukrainians just a year ago. The uh, first uh, discussion about the association agreement with Yanukovych. Mm -hmm. and one year after, there are the different views. Some argue that uh, EU was uh, was not offer uh, uh, Yanukovych at all. Should wait for some more democratization, less corruption, etc. Some argue that it was uh, offering too little when he asked for the money, not just uh, follow uh, the soft uh, soft power advice. What is your Jacques? What is your view? Uh, should what what would be what is your reflection one year after? Did we offer uh, a lot? Did we offer a few? Uh, or we offered just Nothing. what we could? Well, clearly we didn't offer enough to make it an offer you couldn't refuse. And uh, Yanukovych refused the offer. Incidentally, uh, Putin offered very soon after a financial offer that was, uh, uh, you know, you moved from 700 million to something like 15 billion uh, 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 dollars. So, uh, uh, yeah, there is that financial element. And, uh, yeah, there is, there, is, there is a debate among Europeans. Is, were they totally unprepared in uh, offering something like that, that this is, first, too little to make it really enticing for, for, for Yanukovych, and mainly have they miscalculated about Russia. And the main criticism that is now being uh, 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 tabled at, at, at the European Commission, how come you didn't talk to the Russians? Of course, my answer would be, well, why, why would you talk to Russians about the fate of Ukraine? And, and uh, surely this should be a sovereign decision of Ukrainians themselves. But that is easier said than done, and this is uh, where the European uh, uh, debate is. Uh, I think the, the, the Europeans underestimated totally uh, that what was at stake was not just what was on paper on their offer, we open market, there will be visa facilitation, no. That the attraction of the European process, there is something much more important behind it, that behind, okay, the signing of the uh, uh, treaty with, with Europe was just a trigger for something much more important, for a democratic revolution which uh, uh, had uh, a system of government at stake, which had a corruption as its main goal, and which uh, uh, was a movement from below that uh, nobody could engineer. So EU, uh, yeah, perhaps did too little and underestimated both Russian response and the uh, expectation of the, of the population of Ukraine. Gilles, uh, we are facing, uh, if not the same, even uh, more demanding problems uh, uh, in the southern and southeastern uh, direction that we are facing in the eastern direction. I think m many would have agreed with that. So what is the problem? Uh, what is the bilance uh, since five, six years after? We are cla the 21st century is clashing with uh, the 19th century too, or what is your analysis of the development in the south? Uh, sh are we happy with we had some expectations five years ago. There is some reality check right now where we are. Well, thank you very much at first for inviting me to share some thoughts with Jacques. Uh, we've been uh, colleagues and uh, uh, friends for more than 30 years now, so we've passed the threshold of the 30-year friendship and nothing can destroy us. Uh, <laughs> you told us that we were both French, which is true, but we also share a very strong relation with Krutsch, where he spent his part of his childhood, and my father bought a house there, so it's, you had the Vishehrad connection, so this is the Krutz connection into action. Um, I, I will try to, uh, to follow up, uh, because this was a, so a city where Mozart lived, I will propose a variation on Jacques' area, 
and um, try to, to follow his, uh, his lead, written L-I-E-D, uh, with, um, with a comparison between uh, the uh, eastern neighborhood policy and the, and the, and the southern neighborhood policy. And maybe uh, to uh, start from the point where things look alike, uh, let's start with Ukraine, where, as you know, uh, the events that we know about took place in a square called Maidan. Maidan is a Turkish Persian name, which reminds us that Ukraine and Crimea was once under uh, Muslim control. And uh, this is the same name, which is same word which is used in Maidan Tahrir in Cairo, which is Liberation Square. So this, in order to remind us that you know, the east and the south are not uh, always differentiated. And I'm, I was just I'm just back from Russia, and uh, where I could. Uh, notice with a number of meetings with, with Russian officials that to them the southern issue is becoming crucial and from their own eastern point of view the east-south relation is uh, extremely problematic and the decolonization of the Russian Empire has not, uh, is not yet finished definitely. So uh, going back to, to Jacques' uh, very well uh, uh, ordered pattern um, you know he uh, sort of uh, first identified a zone which was uh, Central European Europe, i.e. <coughs> Prague and the rest, Krutsch and the rest, uh, which was um, nicely integrated into the EU to a large extent with an intent on the rule of law and, uh, and an, an attempt to, to fight uh, corruption. And then the more you went towards the east, uh, the more the issue was not only uh, corruption but authoritarianism, i.e. how to build a democratic system and also how uh, Europe has to deal with the issue of energy. Uh, well, when one looks uh, towards the south, we, even though uh, the, um, the meter has not, is not exactly at the same height, uh, nevertheless, uh, we could think in, in more or less parallel terms. Uh, there is uh, the difference being that uh, uh, as of now, uh, not many people think that any part of what constitutes the southern neighborhood could be integrated as such in the European Union. Turkey was a case in point and uh, there were attempts by uh, Turkish politicians and by some European politicians to consider that Turkey would become one day part of the European Union. There was uh, talks were started, but uh, I, I believe now that uh, no one really uh, believes in it anymore, whether it be from the Turkish point of view, even if they pay lip service to it, they are now uh, having a different kind of policy under Mr. Davutoglu. And, uh, and in Europe, uh, Turkey uh, uh, enthusiasts uh, are now uh, not in the capacity to make their views uh, heard, uh, among other things because of the new role of Turkey in, uh, in the Middle East and uh, the way uh, its policy towards Syria and Iraq, towards ISIS or Daesh, is uh, judged and questioned in European circles. So um, I think that the issue of uh, integration into the European Union um, is not really uh, uh, discussed today, uh, if only because uh, the European Union is an issue of identity and uh, of the desire to, to belong, to adhere to a shared identity. And except for Turkey, and for special reason, uh, which I have no time to elaborate on in this brief presentation, we can go back in the Q&A session if there is one afterwards. Um, uh, elites from North Africa, for instance, are not interested politically in selling to their constituencies that they want to be part of Europe. Though, as we shall see, the matter is far more complicated. So I, uh, just like uh, Jacques has uh, differentiated between a sort of a closer neighborhood and a further neighborhood in the east, I think that when we deal with the southern neighborhood, uh, we're dealing also with two different issues. And I'm glad that Ambassador Amrani is here because 
he can elaborate on that as an expert, which I am not. On the one hand, there is North Africa. Uh, North Africa has, i.e. Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, though at different stages, the, the three main North African countries, because you have also Mauritania, which plays a lesser role, and Libya, which is half North African, but which is anyway in, uh, in a derelict state uh, as of today. Those, the three big main North African states have very close relations with Europe. Uh, not only because uh, there is um, a movement of population, of emigration, and so on and so forth, because of the say, very significant uh, importance of French and European influence, uh, which is incomparable with uh, whatever American uh, or English or what have you influence uh, could be observed on the Middle Eastern parts of the, of, of the South, of the, of the South Southern Partnership. Uh, and also because much of the trade uh, of uh, North Africa is directed <coughs> towards Europe and, uh, and um, to a large extent vice versa, I mean, in a significant proportion. One thing, even though, uh, you know, officially no one uh, in the local elites in North Africa wants to sell uh, uh, the European identity to um, uh, to its constituency. When we look at Tunisia, for instance, Tunisia was, is now a country where uh, the ruling group uh, did not take its legitimacy from the fight against French colonialism, but from the fight against an authoritarian regime that was built on, uh, in the, after independence. Uh, as of now, the Prime Minister of Tunisia is French. He's also Tunisian, of course. Uh, Mehdi Juma, he was, he'd made his career in, in Europe. He's uh, now in uh, Tunisia. He will probably go back to uh, Europe or France unless he becomes President of Tunisia, which, uh, of which there is a slight possibility. And uh, in, the, in the Tunis Parliament, uh, there are 10 seats reserved for Tunisians living in France. Uh, which is approximately one-tenth of the Tunisian population today. The same is true, not the same proportion, but the same is true uh, in Algeria, where you have a small amount of uh, MPs who are elected overseas in France, and in Morocco, though you have no MPs elected overseas as such, nevertheless, the role of Moroccans living abroad, mainly in France and in Europe, is extremely important, the Marocains résidents à l'étranger, and so on and so forth. So therefore, there is an important relation, which is not translated in political terms, as was the case for uh, former Central, still Central Europe, former Soviet Central Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, there is something which creates a, dense, a distinct North African reality. And because of the turmoil and the quagmire in the, in the Arab world today, when I I was in North Africa uh, last month for uh, an ex extended talks with the leaders of the region, and uh, I remember the, uh, the, uh, the Algerian prime minister telling me uh, in French, uh, we are not part of Maghreb. I mean, we don't want to call ourselves Maghreb, which means uh, North Africa, or at least in the, um, the, uh, the, the western part of, of the Muslim world, as opposed to Mashrek, right? We are North Africa. We are l'Afrique du Nord, not pas le Maghreb. And by that, he meant that to him, uh, in, the, in the, the view that he had, that <coughs> for Algeria, uh, what was important was the sort of vertical relation, relation between Africa, North Africa, and Europe. <coughs> and it, that it was becoming prevalent, maybe as a principle for precaution, uh, as opposed to the breakdown of, uh, of, of the Middle East. Uh, against, uh, that was, that was uh, quintessential to him. So, and therefore, I believe that one of the reasons why the Tunisian transition, quote-unquote, to democracy, it seems the only one which is some way efficient. I mean, no one knows what the future will look like, but compared to Libya, compared to Egypt, to Syria, to Yemen and the like, it's an achievement. It's largely due to the fact that in Tunisia you have a significant middle class that carries on the, the process, which is educated in both cultures and tradition, both in its uh, uh, Arab, Islamic, Amazir, Berber uh, culture, <coughs> and also in, in uh, French and European culture. And this is, I believe, something extremely important for, for Europe. 
um, that we have to take into consideration. As far as uh, from Libya eastward is concerned, uh, we have, of course, many more problems. And uh, the, the more we go eastward, uh, the less the influence and significance of the European Union is significant. Um, when you talk about, uh, if, if I skip to the, directly to the energy issue, when we look into uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, i.e. Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Kuwait, uh, Qatar, and uh, Yemen and Bahrain, uh, the first uh, five of which are very important, oil, four of which are very important oil and gas producers, the influence uh, and the clout of the European Union is uh, negligible uh, if you compare, uh, compare it with uh, its influence in uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe or, or Ukraine. And therefore, we are not, as Europeans, we are not players of the same category. Uh, definitely, we are we're lesser players. America is the, is, the, is the big name in the game there. And we cannot have exactly the same, the same influence. Uh, what is problematic there is, uh, for Europe is A, the issue of energy, but B, and maybe more important now, and this is something which is, uh, uh, on which everyone is, has been focusing those last years and those last two days in the Prague 2000 Forum, <laughs> is, uh, Forum 2000, is the issue of security. Uh, to what extent are uh, those countries, the, the countries, the, the rogue states uh, that have emerged from uh, the uh, so-called Arab revolutions, the destroyed Libyan system, the destroyed Syrian in Iraqi system, to what extent are they now posing a major security threat, not only in terms of Europe foreign policy, but also of Europe's domestic? issues. Uh, we have officially 1,000, probably uh, double that number, uh, of uh, French people who went to uh, jihad in Syria and Egypt. Uh, most of them from North African descent, but one quarter at least converts overnight to Islam on, uh, after they watched things on YouTube and were recruited through Facebook. And um, the same is true in other European countries. So this is a major issue, it's a major threat, and as, um, as Jacques mentioned in his cl concluding remarks, the fact that there is a lack of project, of projection of the self in Europe, the fact that at the last European elections, the parties that were doubtful about Europe scored such an important gain, the fact that the first French political party now is the extreme right with uh, Madame Le Pen, uh, is of course something which is not very reassuring and which leaves open a vast gray zone in which extremist movements and movements which provide for some sort of a, a ground narrative, a solution where you will build a pure identity of jihad against the corrupt rest of the world is uh, gaining steam. Even though it's not a majority issue, nevertheless, the issue in a number of European countries is not if there will be uh, a bombing or whatever, but when. And this, of course, is going to have tremendous consequences if it is not well managed uh, by uh, the authorities and the European Union. So, I don't want to, to leave you on this dark uh, picture. This is part of the reality, but it's only part of a picture which is multifaceted. And as I, as I mentioned, uh, I believe that as far as, um, as European uh, southern neighborhood policy is concerned, we should pay a very, very important attention to North Africa, because North Africa is definitely uh, our partner of choice, uh, because uh, North African societies, for better or worse, are far more integrated into European societies, whether it be France, um, uh, German, uh, France, Spain, and Italy at first, but also through immigration towards Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, Turkey, uh, Germany, sorry, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, that, I think, should be a far more important priority than it was before under the previous commission. And I hope that uh, the new elected commission will pay uh, more attention to it. Thank you. Thank you.
So to make it simple, it means that your recommendation is to differentiate and to concentrate our effort, both money and, and, and other instrument where we can succeed, and that's in North Africa. Well, I think that uh, in North Africa, mainly as of now in Morocco and Tunisia, uh, there are already instruments for cooperation. There are protocols, and Mr. Amrani will talk more about that because he knows about those, this matter. Algeria uh, probably is still in a phase of transition towards the transition. Mm -hmm. Among other things, because it's, a, it's an oil country and an oil and gas country, but it is facing domestic political challenges, which, in my view, uh, and this is also what I understood from my talks uh, recently with uh, uh, senior uh, Algerian uh, members of government, uh, is more and more um, in, a, in a process uh, where Algerian elites, political elites, uh, are eager to build a stronger rapprochement with, uh, with Europe. Not that we have to, uh, to let the rest of the Middle East aside or the South aside, but the prioritization is not exactly of the same uh, uh, quality. Okay, I think it makes a sense. Now, originally, ah. I, I, I was uh, hoping to give the floor to our Polish friend, but uh, to keep the continuity, I think uh, Josef Mrani, uh, uh, a diplomat and now a cabinet member from uh, the Morocco government, and a man who also had a career as the second uh, secretary general of the Union for Mediterranean, so what is you, you should you, sh you should be happy to listen to this recommendation to prioritize and concentrate on 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 the north of Africa. Uh, are you happy? And what is your what is your uh, I advice? I completely share uh, Gilles Kepel's uh, recommendation as far as the priority to be given today to the Mediterranean. Let me first make some. Uh, preliminary remarks. First, the neighborhood policy at the beginning and you was designed for a stable political and social environment in Europe. It was more access to market, free trade, free trade agreements, but today there is a new context in the region. There is a context in Europe which is difficult the economic crisis in Europe, the complication of the European system, and I know what I'm saying. Today, we're not only talking to the Commission, we are talking to the Commission, we are talking to the High Representative, and since the Lisbon Treaty, we are talking to the, Parliament, the European Parliament, who today is a key actor in shaping the European foreign policy. And we, I'm talking from a southern perspective, Sometimes, and I have negotiated for 10 years the advanced set of Morocco with the European Union, sometimes we are maybe lost with a lot of institutions and a lot of instruments. And I know what I'm talking about because I've been experiencing for the last 10 years the relation with Europe, with a country of Morocco who is, who is considered by the European Union as a model. So we have new context in Europe, Lisbon Treaty. Now we have a new commission and we have the parliament, and today we have a complex and dramatic situation in the South Mediterranean. And this is, I think, I think it's a major concern, not only for us, for the European partners, but also for Europe itself. And also, there the are new thematics in, in this concern. And, Jacques, and Gilles Kepel was talking about security. I remember once I was talking with Cathy Ashton was in Tunisia when the, she didn't know that security was in her mandate. She was only talking about environment, about neighborhood policy, but today the security threat is essential in our relation between two shores of the Mediterranean. Because what is happening today in Libya, the connections with Al-Qaeda and other and Mujawa in, in Sahel has a direct connection with Europe and even now our friends can tell security people that the connection is so strong that we need to work together. We have no more choice than to work toward together. So today, EU is faced with new challenges. And today, Europe, 
because it is, if you want it or not, the Mediterranean, the Sahel, is your environment. So you are obliged to provide <coughs> immediate solutions for complex situations. Very complex. It's to deal with Qaeda and the networking. And I was negotiating with the European Union as far as security is concerned. I can tell you that we have brought a lot of added value as far as how to, to shape and redesign. So today, I think the priority is to uh, reshape uh, the new neighborhood policy. I think there, today there is a consensus. Whether in the, of course, I'm not going to talk about the Eastern Partnership, but even some partners of the, the East insist that the priority should be between the Mediterranean. Of course, there is a difference, and I think uh, Jacques pointed out rightly, we have no political perspective to join the European Union as Mediterranean partners. It's not the case of the countries of the Central Europe. Today, if Czech, if, uh, if uh, Slovakia, if Slovenia, if Poland are member of the European Union, because at that time, the European Union had the necessary tools to accompany these countries. Not only to democratize, but also access to market, modernization, and a lot of money. Countries like Spain, or, or, or for example, like Spain or Greece, I mean, benefited from the Les Francs Structurels et de Cohesion. Thanks to these instruments, you were able to drag them into the construction of Europe. It's not the case today of the Mediterranean countries, for many reasons. I can tell you, and I will speak also about the specific case of negotiation between Morocco and EU as far as the advanced status is concerned. So today, I think uh, 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 what we need is a, a new the, a revision of the neighborhood policy, which should be based on new approaches. New approaches. And we have forget about MMM, money, mobility market, more for more. Of course, it's important we have to continue with this, people, uh, but should be based on, uh, I, I think, on three major uh, elements. Dialogue. We need dialogue to be able, because we have our priorities. We want to share with you our vision and our expectations and our ambitions. So we need dialogue in order for you to understand what are our priorities. Of course, we need differentiation, my second element. It's a key element in the European foreign policy, differentiation. People who do more reforms, who, do more, uh, who have more expectation, should be supported more. And I think this differentiation worked in the case of the Eastern Partnership. And we need incentives. Of course, when you talk to the Commission, when you talk about incentives today, you have to, maybe to forget about it because uh, the economic crisis in Europe, the lack of financial resources is also an epidemic. But and, uh, we, we hope that this will, will, uh, will, uh, will disappear. The two processes are not contradictory. We understand that Europe today, and countries like uh, Czech Republic, uh, like, Poland and, uh, like Poland, and they need to enlarge democracy and they, they need to, 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 to create opportunities for business. Because at the end of the day, it's a question of how much growth. Uh, as I, I like very much the idea of Jirki Pen while I was talking about Turkey. Turkey, yes, today is not any more interested on the European Union, because Turkey is growing economically well. It's doing pretty well. So this is the importance of, the, of, of economic development is essential. But you should not forget, as Europeans, that today, the Maghreb North Africa is an opportunity for you. I'm talking because uh, uh, from a Mediterranean perspective, but it is a large market for European business. This is the future because in order Europe to be able to compete with big markets like China or Central America, you need to have a greater environment where there are perspective of growth. And the Mediterranean, the Arab world, the young generation Arab world are possibility. Now, yes. Yes, Tom, uh, let me, uh, because I need to make some proposals, you know. I don't know why you, you don't, I, I'm speaking less than the others. And this, yes, uh, they, uh, they had more time. More time. Plan. But, you know, I, I am f I'm, I'm only of one from the South. So let me please express <laughs> on behalf of the South this perspective. <laughs> you should not He's think only speaking less, less than others. Not, let, me, let me think that you should not only Facebook, think about market. 15 minutes plus. We need also to have access to a market. 
the second element, I will be very brief. EU thought only about migration. Today, we have two challenges. We have security and we have resolution of conflicts. I think also the ANP must respond to the priorities of the countries themselves. And today, the Arab world has changed. There are new players, new actors. They are not only governments. And here's the working wood saver society. This is also another element in the rapprochement. So I think that, uh, and I will uh, conclude by that, Morocco was able to design something unique with the European Union called the advanced status, which is something between total integration. We share with the European Union all the instruments except the institution. But even the institution, now we were able to have a joint commission from the Moroccan Parliament and European Parliament. We have a joint committee to, 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 to show the Europeans that we have no complex on human rights, for example. We have a joint committee between Morocco and Europe on human rights. We have no complex, no taboo in talking about human rights. And we even have access, access to some the program communautaire. I think today I will finish that Europe is our partner, at least from the Moroccan perspective. We have an ambition. To, 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 to reinforce this relation with Europe. We have an ambition to adhere to the uh, European programs, but we need also some support as far as this new neighborhood policy, because we have some expectations, we have an ambition, and we want this ambition to be met. And, and finally, there is no contradiction between uh, uh, neighborhood policy designed for the Mediterranean and the Eastern Partnership. Then, we have, I don't want to talk about it, but there is also the regional dimension, which is the Union for the Mediterranean. Thank you. Jerzy Poniatowski is a Polish director of uh, the European Endowment of Democ for Democracy, so a kind of a sister organization for uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is uh, sponsoring this, uh, this panel today. And I do remember very well uh, the effort uh, to uh, establish this kind of a, uh, organization among uh, some uh, members of the European Parliament, the Polish government, Sweden, and others, um, simply <coughs> at the time when uh, there was some fear uh, in the North and uh, Eastern Europe that all the resources uh, for the neighborhood policy could be directed to the South. Uh, the recommendation, not just by Jacques uh, Rupnik, uh, you know, assessing uh, the development uh, regarding the Ukraine, but also by uh, Mr. Khodorkovsky yesterday was, we need more money to stabilize the Ukraine. Uh, so this is the question of mine to you. Uh, do you, uh, what is the reality check? You know, our expectation five years ago, uh, the reality now, do we have uh, enough resources to do the job or uh, should we do more? And what is the Polish perspective? Thank you. Um, I will, of course, let's speak about Polish perspective. Thank you for invitation. I am not the Polish director of the endowment, but European, European director of the European endowment. That's my role now, but I do not deny. Uh, some time ago, I was deputy foreign minister yes. of Poland, and uh, I do still uh, have the knowledge, experience, and uh, ideas uh, that were strongly promoted uh, that time by, uh, by Poland uh, and by our colleagues uh, from the whole region, from Czech Republic, uh, from Slovakia, from Hungary, from other Central European countries. So in that context, let me, before I answer your question, uh, uh, come back uh, a little bit to the, uh, our entry, uh, entry lecture by Jacques uh, and Gilles. Because uh, what struck me, especially, uh, uh, I didn't really agree with the element of diagnosis. But uh, I would like a little bit to correct uh, a vocabulary. If, uh, if you say, Jacques, uh, Europe was not prepared for something, you mean France, 
and uh, your Europe. Because we were trying to explain you from the early 90s uh, what is happening in our part of the world, what is happening to Russia. But you were not listening. Uh, you were not listening, and you were not even ready to listen. So you were not even in a transition to transition, as Gilles nicely uh, mentioned, Algeria. So uh, in, in a sense, uh, and we have uh, been stuck as a Poles and, and some others from this region, uh, Baltic countries, because uh, we've been put at label uh, Russophobes, uh, obsessed with Russia. So basically, you don't listen to them because uh, this is uh, something that uh, does not bring any, any creative thinking. <coughs> then suddenly uh, you are shocked. Uh, but I am asking uh, French analysts, have you analyzed the situation of free media in the last 15 years in Russia? how step by step the free media are disappearing and what consequences it brings to the country itself. How Russian society is day by day manipulated over the last 15 years. Those data and those information were there, were available. So it was not that difficult to draw some conclusion and predict and react. Do we have an instrument to send our message directly to the Russian society? not to deal only with Putin and now reopen our old books of Sovietology, criminology, where we are asking ourselves what Mr. Putin was thinking before sleep and what he's thinking when he wakes up. Yeah, because that was the type of science we were enjoying in 70s and 60s, analyzing Khrushchev, Brezhnev, who advised him and whether left leg of, of, of Khrushchev is more painful or right one. And that depends what will be the next move of the Soviet Union. So. In a sense, uh, when we, and today, in the spirit of solidarity, I do share, yes, Europe, as United Europe, was not prepared. But as a, as a proud Pole and a Central European, I do reject this vocabulary. You were not prepared. Uh, we were expecting this type of turn. And you can hear... I'm talking here as a person. Not as I know, <laughs> but you said Europe. You I said have no Europe. no lessons to receive from anybody. On it's not about I've lessons. I've written enough. About Jacques, I am taking you as an example, <laughs> as an example of, certain, uh, of certain group of analysts and scientists because I do suffer. I do suffer from, uh, from this type of... Uh, this type of um, approach that we feel is a weakness of Europe, that we are not able to go out of our, our box. So my great, uh, uh, my great coming back to my main, uh, main message, my main uh, um, concern is whether we are able now to go out of the box. What we can see uh, is now that democracy support, democratization became again a part of geopolitical game. And here we agree, it's a, it's a new, whether it's a surprise or it is not, I can, uh, I can argue for hours and I respect your position in this, but in the same, uh, uh, in the same uh, moment of the history, we need to then ask ourselves, can we jump out of the box? Can we, for example, now shift our uh, paradigm both in analysis and in policy from the state-centered approach, what Yusuf so nicely addressed, to the society perspective, where we try, but this is power of Europe, that we can create direct dialogue between societies. We have tools, we have also uh, practices and traditions, but we are not doing this. How much money has been allocated within Union for Mediterranean and before that Barcelona process to a uh, direct dialogue between society. If we go to the figures, and as a scientist, you can, uh, uh, you can base your reflection on data, it's less than 2% of total fund allocations. So that shows the weakness of our policies. And the same now is uh, uh, within uh, the other part of the neighborhood. What is different that the Eastern Partnership at least a little bit moved this uh, ratio ahead. So instead of 2% for the Union of Mediterranean, it was 10% of the fund allocation for direct, direct uh, work with the societies, building NGO capacities, think tank capacities in Ukraine, in Armenia, in Georgia, in other parts of, uh, of Eastern, Eastern Partnership. And today, again, I hear in Brussels, spending now time in Brussels, I hear that 
people saying we lost Armenia. Armenia has made choice for Euro, Euro Asian Union. But if you go to the Yerevan and you talk to taxi driver, you will hear he is pro-European. He has not made his choice to, uh, to join uh, Euro Asian Union. He knows that he cannot repeat the scenario as in, uh, uh, in Kiev because people are afraid of destabilizing their country and they are having frozen conflict with Azerbaijan, which Russia can defrost any moment they wish to. So here is the motivation. They didn't change their values and their choices. Just these people are accepting the government choice for moment, for time being. So what is our response? We are spending now less money with Armenia. We are reducing our funds to work with Armenia. Is it right policy? It is not. So here I would ask uh, uh, us to, to think uh, whether it is possible that uh, both in the recommendation part, which is in the hand of political scientists, and in the policy making part, that is in the hand of politicians, can we shift from the state-centered approach to more society-centered approach? Can we allocate uh, more resources to do this? And can we jump out of the box in analyzing the trends and the uh, tendencies in the neighborhood? So I sacrifice myself Thank a little you. bit <laughs> in order to uh, balance <laughs> the extended, extended time for the southern member of this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>we, I was talking about the European neighborhood policy as it was conceived, and the people who were in charge of European neighborhood policy, it just so happened that it was run by a Czech <laughs> who, who was in charge of that policy, and he was unprepared. So Czechs were unprepared. Should I generalize and say all the Czechs are unprepared for Russian question? Well, you make your own judgment. Yeah. That's what I said. I meant Thanks. exactly you know, this. We know what you Europe wasn't. Um, I That's think okay. uh, the table I, is now clean. I do respect uh, for this. And I will money. pass the floor to, uh, to Mikola Ryabchuk, the, the leading Ukrainian uh, intellectual, and I think the right man who uh, <laughs> should amuse us now uh, with um, uh, your point of view. Uh, was uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, a successful project? Uh, and what is your recommendation for the next five years? So should we do more? Should we do less? Okay. Well, uh, my uh, point of view is not very amusing, actually. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless. Uh, first of all, uh, I feel that we should not expect too much from uh, European neighborhood policy and from, from the West in general. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, European neighborhood policy was, uh, from its very inception, uh, designed uh, not uh, for democratization or whatever, but first of all for uh, security reasons. Uh, it's perfect illustration of Immanuel Wallerstein model because it was an uh, attempt of the first world countries or the countries of the core to protect themselves from the periphery and to strengthen semi-periphery around them, so just to create this buffer zone and in, in order not to bother uh, with directly with peripheral countries, but to have this encirclement of semi-peripheral countries. So uh, European neighborhood policy was first of all about security, about uh, energy supply, about prevention of uh, uh, refugees, traffic, human trafficking, uh, smuggling, and uh, uh, environmental pollution, and so on. This was the main goal. Of course, if if we manage to democratize these countries, these neighboring countries, it would be fine. Uh, if we establish, uh, promote their rule of law, it would be also fine. But it's not, it was not the primary task, so it's, so it's first of all. 
Uh, secondly, uh, we may also uh, complain that um, two different countries were put into the same bag, and of course, uh, southern uh, neighbors and eastern neighbors were too different. Yes, it's true. Even within these groups, uh, there is also big differences, as we have heard already, between Tunisia and Morocco and uh, Libya and so on. Uh, the same also in the uh, eastern neighborhood. Yes, uh, Ukraine, Moldova is one case, and <coughs> Russia is different, and, and so on. Yes, uh, that's also true. Some of them are aspiring uh, for European Union membership, some not. Uh, but what is common among these uh, states? Of course, all of them are uh, to some degree uh, affected by, uh, va by Western values, by Westernization process. Uh, modernization coincided with Westernization there. Uh, but all of them are sort of... It works? Yeah. Uh, a sort of battlefield between um, some traditional values, which are absolutely anti-Western, anti-Occidental, and, and Western values. So uh, all, all these countries, uh, to different degree, represent this uh, situation of uh, cold civil war between pro-Western, Westernizing part of society, and in the case everywhere, in Ukraine, in Russia, in Turkey, uh, in Morocco and uh, traditionalist uh, uh, part of society which appeals to anti-Occidental, anti-modern values and, and uh, uh, models of behavior. Uh, in, in the case of uh, East or South, it's, it's clear. It's uh, militant Islamism. Uh, it's uh, another spiritual power which challenges the European Union there. Uh, in the case of, case of Eastern neighbors, it's probably some sort of Russian uh, messianism, the so-called Ruski Mir, uh, yeah, Russian world, uh, which can be disguised differently as Sovietism, as Panslavism, as uh, Eurasianism, but basically it's also, it's also um, something very anti-Western and something that also challenges uh, European influence in this neighborhood. So there is something something in common between all these states, even though, of course, they are, uh, the proportion of pro-Western and anti-Western forces is different in each country. That's probably the main difference be uh, between this, uh, among these states. Uh, and uh, I'd like to also to answer uh, the question put uh, by uh, Jacques earlier. Uh, he asked uh, about um, Yanukovych, whether the uh, European Union offered him too much or too little. Uh, I feel that uh, the very emergence uh, of Yanukovych is partly uh, fault of the EU, and especially his evolution. Uh, European Union made three major mistakes. Uh, first of all, uh, did not offer Ukraine anything after the Orange Revolution, even though there was very good window of, of opportunity. And Ukraine could have developed like uh, Romania and Bulgaria and all these Balkan states, because these societies are very similar. Of course, they, all of them require, they need some, some external support, because they have very, very vague balance between this uh, pro-Western and anti-Western uh, old-fashioned uh, for, ancient regime forces. Uh, but uh, Ukraine didn't get this, all, all those things which uh, were offered in the Balkans. Uh, so it was a first mistake. Ukraine was left in the cold, and Russia uh, did its best to undermine and derail further development. Uh, secondly, uh, there was no reaction against Russian invasion in Georgia, and it gave carte blanche to Putin. I, I, believe, I strongly believe that nothing would happen in Crimea and elsewhere if there were at least some minimal sanctions against Russia after invasion in Georgia. It was carte blanche, obviously. And finally, uh, there was no reaction after uh, de facto coup d'etat in Ukraine. Not in February, as Russian propaganda claims, but in uh, March 2010, after Yanukovych was elected president, in free and fair elections, it's true, but it was not uh, his credit, it was credit of uh, previous government that elections were free and fair. But after that, immediately, he uh, created his government in absolutely illegal way, absolutely anti-constitutional, and then he dismantled step by step all institutions. There was no reaction, absolutely. And within two years, again, he, he came to believe that he has carte blanche to do whatever he, he, he wants. By 2000, uh, 2012, he was f fully, firmly entrenched as an as a authoritarian ruler. So after was all these debates, uh, all these negotiations between the EU and Ukraine were uh, a bit um, 
odd because uh, basically they, they were about uh, Yulia Tymoshenko, which is important but symbolically important. It was a tip of iceberg. But this tip of iceberg overshadows the iceberg. That's the problem. Because Tymoshenko per se was not an issue. It, it was a very minor issue actually in Ukraine. And, and again, it's, uh, it was a big mistake you know, to, to, to discuss all the problems uh, to, or to reduce all, all the issues, all the EU-Ukraine uh, relations to this issue issue of uh, freeing or not freeing uh, Tymoshenko. So uh, there, were, uh, there was a number of mistakes and uh, probably they were inevitable, providing some you know, bad knowledge and some uh, stereotypes and, and so on. Uh, I can complain a lot, but I believe that you know, uh, God helps those who help themselves. And uh, of course, it depends primarily on Ukraine and all these uh, countries uh, to which degree they, was, they would be supported. Uh, so we, uh, my uh, main argument, especially in Ukraine, is that, well, we can complain, but first of all, we have to deserve this support. We have to prove that we are worth of this support. This is uh, main main task. And uh, of course, it doesn't mean that we uh, shouldn't uh, fight stereotypes. I remember how um, in the February I was, uh, after Yanukovych was hosted, I, was, uh, I got a number of calls from uh, foreign journalists, and one of them was from Prague. And she asked me, uh, what was there in Kiev, in your uh, opinion? Was it uh, revolution or coup d'etat? And, you know, I was impressed how this young lady uh, easily repeats form formulas from Russian, uh, Russia Today TV. And so I responded in question. And what was there in Prague back in 1989? Was it revolution or coup d'etat? Oh, how, how, how can you compare? Of course it was revolution. But what's the difference? It was the same agenda, the same driving forces, the same, uh, everything was the same. Again, absolutely recently, that was the uh, dismantle, dismantled monument to Lenin in Kharkiv. A huge event because it was a very huge monument and uh, local authorities uh, are uh, still from the party of regions, Yanukovych supporters, they rule the Kharkiv region. So of course they, they vehemently oppose this dismantling of monument, but nonetheless people dismantled this monument. And you know, I read uh, information uh, by reputable associated press agency, which is basically objective, but the message is that uh, in Kharkiv uh, nationalists dismantled monument to Lenin, thereby they express their uh, um, uh, resentment, uh, anti-Russian uh, sentiment. You know, Lenin's monuments were dismantled everywhere in Eastern Europe, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary, and, and everywhere it was perceived as anti-authoritarian, anti-totalitarian move. Why in Ukraine it was nationalistic move? Why in Ukraine it was perceived as anti-Russian and here not? It's absolutely the same monuments, the same people, the same... So, you know, of course, I understand that uh, in all these revolutions, different uh, political forces uh, took part. There were uh, liberals, there were nationalists, socialists, anarchists, whoever, because it was common cause to, to fight. But here, uh, democratic movement was emphasized. In Ukraine, all the time, I hear how nationalistic movement is emphasized. Well, folks, take a look at uh, electoral results. Take a look at sociological survey. Uh, nationalistic parties in Ukraine get far less than anywhere in Europe in, 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 vote, in voting. But still we have this, this problem. So um, I don't expect too much because I know, I know too much about, about this uh, world, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I believe um, all the time I recollect the saying of uh, Ukrainian classic uh, who, uh, writer who wrote 100 years ago to his uh, friend uh, in, in private letter, he wrote that, well, uh, you know, uh, Mikhailo, uh, we, should, uh, we shouldn't complain too much uh, because the world uh, helps not uh, those who complain, who are beaten, but those who fight back. So we have to fight back. <laughs> We have to fight back. It brings us back to the United States uh, role in the world because the last 25 years we can divide into two eras. One, uh, 1990 to 2008, when the West was in offensive under the leadership of the US. We were celebrating a lot of successes. And then since that, uh, seeing the US leading from behind, like it was the formula uh, used in Libya, if I remember well. Uh, and uh, having a problem. So 
Tomilia is a guy, you know, we met first uh, in 1990 when uh, he was not leading from behind, but on the uh, stage of the NDI uh, supporting uh, the first three elections, uh, including Czechoslovakia, uh, working hard for uh, the various NGOs like Freedom House, etc. And now having a position of uh, assistant, uh, deputy assistant uh, secretary of state for uh, human rights, democracy and labor. Uh, so certainly the men uh, in charge and uh, uh, with a lot of experiences. So what is your comment, what uh, you have heard uh, and what we can expect uh, from you? You know, you will leave this up to Europe or will you, will you uh, take part too? That's a provocative way to put the question, Sasha. <laughs> I thought the question of this panel was, what is Europe's role in the democratization of its neighborhoods, east and southern? We live on maybe either the northern frontier or the western frontier, but it's your frontiers to the south and the east. Um, so I'm going to answer my question, and then maybe we can debate your question. Um, because I think there's an important role for Europe to play in uh, promoting democratization in its neighborhoods. Uh, and first and foremost, it requires that Europe be the best Europe you all can be. Uh, and that means to be the best example of uh, a society based on justice, inclusion, civil liberties, and fundamental freedoms. Uh, and to keep working at that because it's not done yet. Uh, and in Europe, which sometimes means the European Union, but it's more than that. Um, there's already some backsliding. You know, 25 years on, we're seeing some countries moving in the wrong direction, as well as some countries that have been slow to get with the program, all of whom find themselves in the EU. So just as there can be no free riders in NATO, everybody has to pay their share and participate when called upon uh, in the wider security challenges that we face in the world, so too, I think there should not be any free riders in the democracy, uh, the, democ the democratic consolidation of Europe. Uh, and you have, in a, at least in one nearby country, uh, shall be remain named, but remain unnamed, but where they speak Hungarian. Um, you know, you have some significant backsliding uh, underway now, and it's providing a challenge to Europe that I don't think Europe has faced up to yet. Um, and then there are challenges farther afield uh, in Ukraine. Uh, in Armenia, in uh, Azerbaijan, um, where the outcome of the contest is unclear. And uh, there are things that Europe can do, uh, but I think the first and most important thing is for Europe to strengthen its own institutions and its own democratic habits uh, and to keep working at that and realize that that's not accomplished yet. And we see it in the vulnerable, marginalized populations of the Roma and the LGBT communities, but we also see it in some of the political dysfunction that uh, keeps some of the countries from moving forward and the European Union as an institution from moving forward. So that would be my first answer to the question is that Europe has to be the best Europe it can be. My second answer for Europe is uh, resist the temptation to cynicism and despair. You will be advised by experts from all the countries we're talking about that cynicism and despair is the right way to go. It's the smart, realist way to go. Um, but I would urge that Europe continue to resist that advice. Um, the Arab Spring of 2011 turns out not to have been 1989. But that doesn't mean we have to give up for North Africa and for the Middle East. Uh, it may be that 2001 was 1956 or 1968 or 1980 uh, and there has to be a, another effort made in the countries of the Arab world to reboot the instinct, to reboot the effort to uh, build more democratic societies. Ukraine is now on its third major democratic transition in 20 years. Uh, maybe this one will get some traction and really move forward. Uh, the previous two were knocked off course by Democrats or nationalists or anti-communists or anti-Russians, but uh, they got knocked off course because people got involved in their petty squabbles. And right now Ukraine has a, some big challenges posed by Russia's aggression, but it also has a terrific opportunity to 
mobilize itself and move in a distinctly better direction, as many in uh, Ukraine want to do. But this uh, temptation to cynicism and despair will recur again and again. And I have to complain a little bit. I know the topic of this year's conference is democracy and its discontents. But all of the panel discussions have been had this backdrop that is full of all of this sad, forlorn remarks about democracy not living up to its reputation. Uh, I feel like I have let you down, says democracy to whomever. Um, and this is the, you know, 25 years ago when I came here and met Václav Havel and Sasha Vandra and other people, um, the art was buoyant. Uh, the, the, Czech and the Czechoslovak and the Czech Revolution was characterized by terrific outpouring of artistic expression. That was part of why Czechoslovakia was moving in the direction it was. It was the uh, suppressed free expression that was coming to the surface and finding expression in so many ways. Uh, and I hope we can get um, some more invigorating art in uh, the Czech uh, public space going forward um, because I think it does matter. It, does mobilize, it either mobilizes us to move forward or it lets us sort of sit back and think that it's too hard and, and uh, too difficult. So um, my third and final response to uh, my version of your question, which is what can Europe do to promote democracy in its neighborhoods, is to think, um, think globally uh, be ambitious and opportunistic in the way that the European Endowment for Democracy is intended to be. Uh, it's not huge amounts of money, but it can be deployed adroitly and can help key movements and actors and seek to help move moments in the right direction. Uh, there are major European NGOs uh, from Western Europe, from Central Europe. Here in Prague, we have an organization called People in Need, which is a terrific example of a civil society organization that goes globally and helps in humanitarian crises and also to help move uh, political actors, uh, empower democratic civil society to move their countries forward. And uh, so there's, there's that, that, that kind of energy here in, in Europe and in Central Europe. And I want to encourage uh, Europeans to remember that they can do a lot. Uh, now, I don't see him in the room, but my friend uh, Professor Shlomo Avineri, who's presided over several panels in this conference, said this morning at one panel in passing, and this loops back to Sasha's introduction, that the West has failed uh, the Middle Eastern countries in this moment of potential transition. And it may be that we haven't done enough, uh, we're not forward-leaning enough, or we're not smart enough, or we haven't applied enough money or muscle, but uh, I would encourage Europeans to remember that it wasn't the United States that liberated Central and Eastern Europe. It was Poles and Czechs and Slovaks and Hungarians and Slovenians and Estonians. Uh, these are the people that brought the end of communism in Central and Eastern Europe. It was not the United States. The United States did have an important role to play uh, militarily, politically, and through, again, targeted small amounts of support to key political movements like the Solidarity Movement in Poland once upon a time. But we didn't make Solidarity. We didn't make Obshansky Forum. We didn't make uh, you know, the political parties of Hung Hungarian opposition. Uh, people in this region did. They liberated themselves. And I think that's what we have to remember when we look to Ukraine and Armenia and to Egypt and Tunisia, is it's going to be the people of those countries that are going to determine their future. We can be helpful. We can be encouraging. We can sometimes apply penalties uh, for bad actors that are holding them back, whether in their own governments or in regional powers. Um, and I think we, we in the United States from afar should always be challenged to do more and be thinking smarter about how we can help uh, infuse our policies with our stated values. Um, and that's our policy conundrum, our dilemma, our, what, what I do for a living every day in Washington is to try to uh, help my colleagues see the long-term stability and security and prosperity that comes from more democratic operating environments. Um, and so we're, we're doing that. Uh, but Europe has a lot to do, and I, I think that uh, one of the things I've learned in this excellent adventure in the U.S. government in the last four years is that every place I go, whether I'm talking to government officials or civil society people, uh, I first get the lecture on how the United States should not come in and tell them what to do. You know, you don't know us, we're really different, we're unique, we're far away, uh, don't tell us what to do. 
And then before I can get out the door, they're asking how I'm going to solve their problems. <laughs> what is the United States going to do to solve our problems? Um, so we're comfortable with that uh, dichotomy and discourse. Um, but I think the answer is that we will help people who help themselves to adapt uh, Mikola's uh, uh, paraphrase of the famous uh, God helps those who help themselves. So we will help those who are helping themselves. Uh, and uh, we depend on uh, free peoples, whether they live in a free country at the moment or not, to speak up for themselves. And uh, I hope my government will always be there for them. But uh, what's more important is that uh, the people of each country stand up and speak up for themselves. Good. Okay. I have another final one. Uh, okay, we do have now about seven minutes. Seven minutes. So I think it's uh, an opportunity to wrap up uh, two voices, maybe three voices, quick voices from the audience, and then uh, some quick responses. So please identify your name and put a question. Jaroslav Angel. Uh, yesterday, uh, Michael Anti, a Chinese blogger, was asked how we can help you fighting for freedom. This is about security issue. And he responded, well, you will help us if you fight for freedom in your countries. Yeah. Because what's happening now in Europe, in the US with NSA and so on, is very closely watched by our governments, by our authorities. So I would just comment and maybe it's a question to you as well. Yeah, okay, so you are least. Uh, another point from the audience. Yes, there is. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, Charles Ross, European Anti-Corruption Center. I am reminded by the professor's interesting uh, introductory comments and the secretary's comments. Some 35 years ago, at the time of the Polish Revolution, I had the great honor to write a paper in a French strategic journal where, in fact, I predicted that in the post-Soviet space there would be a European invasion of Europe. So when the disaster happened in Crimea and eastern Ukraine, I was personally not surprised. I had been waiting for it. But it does bring up the point of this colloquium. And that is that, indeed, the offer from the West, from Europe, with the support of America, to a Ukrainian transition was insufficient to counter a long prepared strategy behind the strategy that Mr. Putin's Russia has inflicted upon Ukraine and has created a significant and major strategic threat to stability and international trade in the West. So I'd like to ask the panel, perhaps in closing, what is the method, following from the Secretary's questions and encouragement, what is the method to improve the offer to Ukraine and to Africa to allow people in their own countries to seize the time, to enjoy the quiet freedom that, in fact, they wish, because in fact, quiet freedom is the substance and fundament of democracy. It's about protecting the people you love. And that is about peace. Thank you. Okay, the last question. I don't see anybody. So we should uh, wrap up uh, the panel uh, to, to finish on time. Maybe you should respond to the last uh, question, and I would add a flavor to that. Uh, 25 years ago, when we have met in Prague, you know, the Americans, the Czech, freedom-loving people, you know, just two Woodstock generations, you know, sharing same principles, uh, believing in freedom, and being 
tolerant, so we did not need to explain so much. Now, 20 years after, or 25 years after, I remember just to, to, to add a comment. It was one or two weeks before the annexation of Crimea, when the European Council was meeting at the top level, uh, and also the US government was commenting it was a Sochi Olympic Games, and LGBT uh, issue uh, seemed for the Western decision maker as the largest uh, problem on, 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 on the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, meantime, he was preparing an invasion into Crimea. So, uh, you know, I feel like a compass without poles. You know, maybe isn't it a real problem uh, for those who are living in uh, Kiev, in, in, in Moscow, in, in, uh, in Donbass? that we are expecting maybe too much and then we are defeated in a confrontation with the 19th century politics. So shouldn't we use some instrument of the 20th century or late 20th century to cope with the 19th century? I guess I have a, a couple of comments to that. Um, uh, one is, yes, um, we should... Uh, be going high tech and we should be going low tech uh, and we should be enabling people to communicate. Uh, as uh, Shimon Panak said earlier today, face-to-face uh, -face human contact in supporting like-minded Democrats is, remains as vital as it ever has. You can't just send a tweet to uh, Burma and hope that they'll build a democracy from that. So I, I think that's right. If you mean by 20th century methods, I think that's part of it. We need to uh, not be as so dazzled by the technology that we forget the people and that we need to be engaged on a regular basis. Um, and I think we need to be reminded, as these conferences do, of our purpose. You know, if we are Democrats, how do we uh, talk about that and uh, share it and make it real for people without being uh, clumsy and counterproductive and uh, all that? So it's a question of how to be smart. Um, uh, we, we can do more and we should do more um, but again I, I resist the, the notion that somehow it's ours to decide what happens in all these foreign countries uh, it's up to the people of these countries uh, and what happens in, you know, in Crimea we're in this strange place now in Crimea and in uh, uh, Moldova and other places where it's fallen to the West, the United States and our European allies, to defend the artificial borders drawn by Stalin and Khrushchev. Uh, there was an earlier discussion about the artificiality of boundaries in the Middle Eastern countries drawn on maps in London and Paris uh, in previous decades. And so we are in a strange place uh, on Crimea. Um, but I think because of the way it happened, because it involves the aggression that Russia has launched that has to be resisted. And uh, we're embarked on that. And again, there has to be no, fr there cannot be free riders in confronting the Russian aggression. All the Europeans have to, and people in Australia and, uh, and Japan and elsewhere, have to be firm in supporting the sanctions regime, which is bringing real costs to Russia and real costs uh, to the Russian government. So I think there's a way for us to be smart and strong uh, at this moment, and right now we need all Europeans to be part of the solution to the current challenge we face. Thank you. So, uh, is there somebody volunteering to respond to the question on NSA and uh, the general question of freedom and uh, I think Chinese blogger? <laughs> if I may there just uh, add one point to this uh, element. Uh, I strongly believe in value-based uh, uh, foreign policy and also in value-based approach to key issues, especially when, as it is said on this, uh, on this backdrop, uh, when we are losing compass or we are losing uh, poles. That is the moment when you have to go back to basic values. So if we cannot make sure that we respect those basic values within Europe, of course we are also losing capacity to uh, uh, attract uh, someone with those values. But that's a one side of the story. Another side of the story is that 
it's also a flip side of the situation when there is uh, a, a moment of dilemma, and this dilemma was brought here about security and democracy. Are we happy what is happening now in Egypt? Are we accepting CC further deterioration of democratic attempt of Egyptian people and desire? Yes, we do. We do not have a policy to react because security, regional stability is becoming now more important. So this is the, 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 the element and I think it equally applies. I want to, to challenge this, uh, this story about uh, a Russian offer and, uh, and, uh, and the Western offer to Ukraine. It's totally artificial paradigm. It's, it's illusion. It's never happened. It's not a Yanukovych who was deciding on signing or not signing association agreement. It is a Ukrainian society. And the Ukrainian society made a choice. And what Thomas said, we should care about what people are saying, not what Yanukovych was saying. So there was no offer for people from Russia. Yeah. You have something? No, no. Jack? Shil? Thank you very, very much. I think uh, they deserved a great uh, deal of our appreciation for this performance. Thank you.